Good evening, everyone. Today is February 16th, 2015, and welcome back to Veterans Voices, a monthly talk show focusing on veterans' issues. I'm your host, Nathan Johnson, and I'm joined by my co-host, Kevin Graves. We'd like to start off with a video that really sums up the mission of this show. It's from Operation Got Your Six. For more than a decade, our country has been at war. And as our service members were trained to wage war, they were also trained to wage leadership and loyalty and teamwork. They were trained to wage compassion and problem solving and understanding. Our military veterans were trained to wage good. And as they return home, we have a chance to join them and wage good for all Americans. By empowering our veterans to strengthen our communities as volunteers and first responders, teachers and small business owners, as neighbors and friends. The Got Your Six campaign is dedicated to waging good by bridging the civilian military divide and helping returning veterans realize their true potential as leaders and community assets. So help us wage good at gotyoursix.org. I've got your six. 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 Tonight our show is titled Reboot 3, Veterans Serving in the Community. We feel that it's important to have a show in which we discuss the opportunities and importance of veterans continuing to serve in their community. It's commonly known that one of the difficulties in transitioning out of the military is finding new missions or new purpose, making new friends, feeling connected to your community, or having new experiences. Tonight's show will feature organizations and veterans who model the very real opportunities for community service that exist for veterans today. We are broadcasting our show tonight from Contra Costa Television Studio, and we are also live streaming the show on our website. That means if you don't have cable, go to our homepage, ContraCostaTV.org forward slash Veterans Voices, and watch the show there live in real time. We will be taking your calls, emails, and live chats. We look forward to it anytime during the show. Our phone number is 925-313-1170, and our email appears below. We welcome you to ask questions anonymously through our live chat link located on the top left of our home page. Tonight, we want to hear from you. It's important. This show is called Veterans Voices. We want to hear your thoughts on our topic. Now that you are home from the military, do you continue that spirit of service to your community? Do you participate in any community service activities? We want to hear your experiences, so call right now, email or live chat to us on Contra Costa tonight. We are now going to show you videos that outline the giving spirit of two great organizations, Team Rubicon and The Mission Continues. We all have a purpose. Sometimes it comes to us without calling. And sometimes we come upon it after a dark, dusty journey, not sure of what we'll find or who we'll be when we come out the other side. And we find we're navigating a road of cause and effect, learning it all connects back to what we've done, what we are doing, and who we are becoming. To find our purpose in the turn of a key, the click of a button, or the swing of a hammer, in a handshake, a hug, a high five. From sore muscles, blistered feet, dust in our nostrils, mud in our ears, or from supporting these soiled souls from afar, making their four hours of sleep look a bit more solid and that stiff back a little more ready to tackle the new day. For when that purpose comes knocking, we stand on the line and stare it down, pulling that hard routine into a full-on bear hug embrace. And when it tests us, we wince instead of whine, we grunt instead of groan, we ask for more instead of crying uncle. We all have a purpose. But in the end, how you define your purpose, well, that's up to you. Today, just one in every 100 Americans serves in our armed forces. They train, they deploy, they fight, they come home. And when they do, the mission continues, offers them a challenge to continue to serve, 
to continue to inspire through community service fellowships and funding that lets veterans put their experience, leadership, and talents to work here at home. Across America, the mission continues. Veterans are making a difference in their communities and in their own lives. Now they can find the same sense of purpose that they experienced in uniform, and their dedication and effort can lead to new careers, new opportunities, further education, and a successful transition home. To learn more about the Mission Continues and be a part of the challenge, visit missioncontinues.org. We are now joined by two veterans who are involved with the organizations you just saw in those great videos. Deb Cottrell is here from the Mission Continues, and Angie Anderson is from Team Rubicon. Welcome, Deb and Angie. Hi. Hi Thanks thank for you. having us. So, Deb, tell us a little bit about what Mission Continues does. Well, the video you just saw was about the fellowship program. The Mission Continues has two ways you can volunteer through the fellowship program if you're a post 9-11 veteran or if you're a veteran from any era, you can join what's called the service platoon. And I'm with the service platoon in the Bay Area and we go into the community and we work with other veterans that join us and we go in and do projects and help veterans feel a part of the community and we create uh, relationships with other veterans and other nonprofits. <coughs> now, Deb, you're a veteran yourself. Yes. And tell us a little bit about your service. Uh, I served in the U.S. Army. Um, I, I did four years. I traveled in Europe and I uh, came back to the United States and I was actually um, with the Big Red One in mm -hmm. Fort Riley, Kansas. And I was a wheeled vehicle, uh, vehicle mechanic and I also worked on tanks and then once my first sergeant realized I could type, I became the training NCO, so I left the, the motor pool. Well, thank you for serving. Thank you so much. And Angie, tell us about your military service. Um, I'm a 22-year Air Force veteran, retired in 2012. I uh, served in the medical career field for 22 years. Fantastic. And you're with Team Rubicon. Yes, Team Rubicon is an organization that focuses on giving vets a purpose after their military service uh, finishes um, by providing disaster relief to our own, our very own communities. Um, it started in 2010 with a, um, an, um, it started in Haiti after a disaster there and it continues um, all over the United States and actually globally with veterans responding and helping out communities after disaster to bridge the gap between uh, the, the disaster itself and when the traditional uh, organizations get there to give aid. Fantastic. In fact, I, I saw on your website that because of the military experience that your members have of Team Rubicon, you're able to go in and do some things that the conventional um, disaster relief organizations can't do because of your training and ability to, uh, to go into what might be considered areas that aren't safe to be in yet and that type of thing. Yes, that's actually how we got our name. Uh, once the, uh, the, our founding members crossed, crossed over um, from the Dominican Republic into Haiti, uh, the, vet, the organizations warned them not to go. Uh, it was a little dangerous. It wasn't a secure area, but they went anywhere. They, cr they crossed the point of no return or the Rubicon. And um, we can go in and we, we have volunteers that can, that can wield chainsaws and, and get trees off of houses and, and things of that nature that you, you won't see the Red Cross doing so much. Mm -hmm. So um, we, have, we have skills that we bring from the military that are, are very valuable in times of disaster and veterans that are looking for a way to give back to their community, join another team of veterans and uh, have a, a point of service. Fantastic. Yeah, I think it's great that we're featuring these organizations because most, most people in the community, most veterans are familiar with some of the main uh, veteran service organizations like VFW and American Legion. And these are two brand new organizations. These efforts didn't exist up until you recently you said 2010. H how did these organizations come about? Was it one individual veteran or a collection of veterans who got together and said that they needed to stay involved and, and stay in serving their communities? Well, with the mission continues, um, our founder, <coughs> served in Iraq and he came back and he said, we need to do something with our veterans. So he started the Mission Continues, um, Eric Greitens mm -hmm. and um, a couple of his uh, SEAL buddies. They were uh, SEALs. So 
they wanted to give back to the community, and we continue yeah. to do that. Good as, for them. As the name, the mission continues. Great. And our founding member, members um, were watching television as the the hurricane um, ravaged Haiti, and they they felt like they needed to go do something. So they actually. Uh, a couple of them hopped on a plane and went and went into an area where everybody said they shouldn't go, and wow. they they made a real difference. Took a risk. Took a risk, mm -hmm. made a, a huge difference to the to the population there and the communities, and decided that they needed to continue that back here at home, and and thus Team Rubicon was born. Yeah, that's fantastic. And and Deb, you've been mentioning that that mission continues is broken down into platoons. And so we're all familiar with platoons from the military. Mm -hmm. We serve in platoons uh, while we're in the service. And so you're a platoon leader. Tell us a little bit about your role as a platoon leader. And tell us a little bit about how being a platoon leader has impacted your life as a veteran. Well, thanks for the opportunity. Um, as you know, in the military service, you have platoons and then you have squads. So with the Mission Continues as a platoon leader, which I just, this is a brand new role for me. I was actually a volunteer and now I, I've been uh, given this opportunity to be the platoon leader. I have squad leaders underneath me and we go and recruit or share our mission with others. And basically it works like a, a platoon. You. Uh, it trickles down, so the platoon leader looks for the mission, and the squad leaders are supportive, and we go into the community, and we're looking for veterans or even civilians who are just want to give back. Um, for me, it feeds my soul, so this, that's why I do it. I just want to remind everyone that tonight's topic is veterans serving in the community. And we have Deb from Mission Continues and Angie from Team Rubicon, who are both veterans themselves, who are participating in very important opportunities to serve their community. If you want to call in with a question or a comment, please do so, or you can text or email us as well. Uh, a little bit about how serving with Team Rubicon has affected you, Angie. Uh, as a hospital administrator in the Air Force, part of my wartime mission was um, d disaster relief from the medical perspective. Um, I actually saw one of our founding members do an interview on the Katie Couric show and uh, as soon as I saw as soon as I saw the organization I knew that was a way for me to tie in my experience and my expertise with an organization that that could use my skills and um, so immediately I, I, f I found them on the internet and and joined so that I could use my um, disaster relief skills immediately with the team. Well, uh, Angie and Deb, thank you for being on the show tonight. We have an email, but we're actually going to take that email during a later part of the segment. I do hope that uh, our audience has paid attention to our quick little featuring of Team Rubicon and Mission Continues. And, and I want to thank you guys for what you are doing to give uh, other veterans an opportunity to serve. Because I think it's important that, that people can see from your experiences how, um, how it's fulfills a purpose for you in your life. And I want to thank you for your service, not only to our country uh, when you were in, but for what you're doing to, uh, to, to better the community uh, now. We appreciate the time uh, to talk about our organizations and giving back to the community. Yes, thank you so much thank for you. having us. We'll return after this short video clip. In the moments following the deadly plane crash at the Reno Air Races, a group of Bay Area men sprang into action to help the injured. They'd come to display their vintage helicopter. But as Ann Notarangelo shows us, that historic Huey found itself pressed back into service. No one was ready for this horrifying sight, but one man's lifetime experience made him ready to respond. To me, it was unreal. There was no big parts left. No big parts at all. Pilot Ray Murphy's been flying since 1966, including two tours in Vietnam and careers in the U.S. Army and the FAA. He's part of a team based out of Buchanan Airfield that takes this vintage Huey on tour. On September 16th, they were at the Reno Air Races. As soon as you heard the thud, because it wasn't, you just, you knew something was wrong. Within minutes, the crew, accustomed to showcasing this iconic aircraft, brought her out of retirement, transporting crash victims to a park across from the hospital. He's like, no problem, let's get this thing going. Someone requested, can you help? Uh, basically, our team just jumped into action. We got the, uh, the wheels onto the helicopter, and uh, the group that was next to us 
um, came over and helped everyone push it out onto the tarmac. We're back live in the Contra Costa Television studio. If you're just tuning in, this is our community service special, Reboot 3, Veterans Serving in the Community. We need to hear from you, so call or email us with questions or comments. We are now joined by Mike and Brent from the Vietnam Helicopters Museum. And Brent and Mike, thank you for being here. Uh, I've known you both now for a little period of time, but have known more about the Vietnam Helicopters uh, Association for several years now because of its impact uh, in the community with the Huey that's been flying around and parades and a special events. So thank you both for being here. You bet. You bet. And tell us a little bit about yourselves before we start talking about the, uh, the organization and, and your community service. Mike, tell us uh, about your service in the military. I, uh, I served for 40 years in the Army as an aviator, and I retired in 2009 from the National Guard. So and I had an opportunity to go Vietnam veteran. Uh, that's where I started out and ended up OEF, OIF, Iraq, Af Afghanistan, and then finally uh, back in the States at Nevada. Wow. So, Incredible. Long, long career. Uh, so. Very long, but you must have been very good at what you did. Well, it's, it was a lot of fun. I, I, uh, when I first joined, uh, I had no intention of staying in the Army, but Vietnam was going on at the time. But each assignment I had was just wonderful, and, and I'm an aviator, and the, as a pilot, you, that sort of grows on you. So uh, that's next story was each, each, cons uh, each assignment after that was just a, a lot of fun, a lot of experience, so I really enjoyed it. And Brent, I've had the privilege of having you fly me around in the Huey a few times. Tell us a little bit about your military career. We have, uh, I joined the Marine Corps in 1989, uh, did the Gulf War, got out in 93. Uh, great tour. I, I truly loved being in. I love serving. Uh, met some of the greatest guys I've ever come across being in the Corps. And, uh, it's fantastic. It was, a, it was a good tour. I really enjoyed it. Mm. And your son is in the mil in the Marine Corps as well, and uh, I just got back home from a tour in Afghanistan, what, about six months ago? Yes. And yes. you wanted so to say hi to him? That I did. I want to say hi to him. He's out in uh, North Carolina, Camp Lejeune, uh, CLB-6, uh, my son Isaac. And uh, yeah, he's got a great group out there, and uh, I'm very proud of him. Uh, he had a great tour in Afghanistan, and uh, he's doing well. I'm real proud of him. Good. Very good. Well, so the, we've all heard the Huey flying around here in, uh, in Contra Costa County. You hear it coming before you even see it. It's got that very distinct thud. But what a lot of people don't know is what that Huey is doing. And the two of you, this is a very special opportunity because the two of you are pilots of this Huey. Mm -hmm. And uh, this Huey has had a huge impact in our community. And maybe you could tell us a little bit about some of the missions that you've flown on. Folks at uh, um, Vietnam Helicopters refurbished it and uh, FAA certified to fly experimental exhibition, which means that we can take passengers and put on air shows and things like that. And principally, uh, what we do is in, in the community service realm is, is uh, educate the public on, on uh, military aviation and then, of course, with the veterans. I do a, a great role in uh, flying veterans that uh, are Vietnam era or uh, today's veterans that are getting out now. And particularly, we've, we've gotten reports back that uh, those folks that uh, have come back from Afghanistan and Iraq that particularly the PS, PTSD folks, it's really been a, a cathartic thing for them to get on board the aircraft mm -hmm. or the Huey once, right. once again. Right. So uh, that's the kind of effort that we try and do is make the community aware of uh, these veterans need support and then they in turn support the community. Yeah, I've heard that as well because the Huey is, is a workhorse in the military. Uh, back in Vietnam, through Desert Storm, and even through Iraq and Afghanistan, the Huey, amongst other helicopters, might have brought them in uh, or even took, taken them back out. Uh, it may have even saved their life if they were injured, right? So you oh, absolutely. About, yeah. yeah. Uh, it, it was the workhorse of the Army. It still is uh, operating in, in uh, those areas and regions of uh, Afghanistan and Iraq for other companies and, and some, some service organizations and foreign, foreign governments. But it's, it's still kicking, it's alive, and it's a great machine. And so you volunteer your time to fly this Huey. To fly this Huey. Mike, you live in Reno, Nevada. Yeah. Here we are in Contra Costa County. So you volunteer many hours to, uh, and, and Brent, you have a career with uh, California Highway Patrol, so you even dedicate some of your off time. Uh, what does being a part of this flying Huey mean to you as veterans? Uh, what, what, what joy or what's, what part of serving in this association uh, do, you, do you enjoy the most? Uh, for me, it's I mean, it's incredibly rewarding. I mean, besides the fact that I get to operate a Huey, uh, which you know the hands of uh, these guys when they were real young were out there doing incredible missions. Now I get to 
fly a helicopter that they did so much in. That's that's phenomenal. So I enjoy that. But listening to these guys, seeing the impact, you can just see it in their eyes that that satisfaction that. There's just something about it that's just really incredible. A lot of these guys, sometimes they can't put words to it, but you can see it. You see it in their eyes. And just to be a part of that or to hear these guys, all of a sudden they'll start naming cities and, and hills and bases. And, you know, there's just that connection. And there's that, your family again. And you're, you're, in, you're in a good place. And that Huey, I had one a veteran, right? I'd only flown maybe two or three missions. And he was standing back and he had an incredible look on his face. He's like, this is the helicopter that took me to the bowels of hell, the worst ever. But wow. I heard that sound, and yeah. that was what brought me out again. Right. And it's just, I'm honored to be a part of it. Right. I, I imagine for some, it gives them the opportunity to talk about some of their experiences that they've never talked about before in their life. Things Absolutely. that they've kept to themselves and things that they thought they shouldn't be talking about. But yet, when they have this opportunity, they hear that thump, 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 thump again. Mm. It, it kind of yeah, it stirs it, the emotions. It's amazing when you get a group of guys in there to, to take them for a ride, essentially, that, that uh, haven't said much about it to the families, particularly about their experiences and, and or in groups or out in public and uh, that sort of thing. But you get that collective group in there, and before you know it, it's, uh, it's an amazing connection that you've established over time being in the military anyway. So it's, it's, there's a lot of a sense of freedom with it, and people just start talking about all sorts of things and, yeah. and so it's a great time. It's a thrill and I, I've flown on it a few times at the Duck Club trip mm -hmm. and we'll, we'll start talking about the Duck Club when we get the Vietnam vets at Diallo Valley on, on the set tonight but I want to go to an event in which you both had a, a role in that took place a couple of years ago and we showed it during the, the video that le, uh, led into the segment and uh, this was your involvement during the catastrophe at the Reno Air Races and it wasn't something that you obviously had put yourself in the place to, to have a role but because you dedicated your lives and volunteered in the community to serve as a part of this Huey, this Huey ended up serving an important role at this, uh, this Reno Air Race catastrophe, and you were both there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think Brent can speak to the actual, um, the, the, heli the Huey being there. I was flying another helicopter that day, a Cobra mm -hmm. attack right. helicopter, and I was parked uh, adjacent to the Huey. So, um, but obviously, uh, when the event happened, the Huey crew sprung into gear, and my, my crew chief, the crew chief on the Cobra, a Marine veteran, actually orchestrated getting the Huey out and on its way down to the other end of the uh, runway uh, uh, to, to help out the citizens there uh, and that were hurt, injured in the, in the uh, event. Uh, they, the amazing part about it is that the, Ray Murphy, who was actually the pilot of the aircraft, um, cranked that aircraft up, got it in position, flew it down to the other end of the runway before any reaction from the EMS helicopter or the military standby aircraft uh, was, got their stuff going. So they flew the first uh, uh, casualties out. So it was a pretty good experience for them, but all that stuff just turns on immediately, and, and it was a reactionary thing based right upon in the their medevac mode. Ma huh? ma yep, yeah, unbelievable. Uh, reactionary based upon their experience and sure. background. It's just an automatic thing, and they just did it on their own, you know. So it was amazing, amazing effort. Brent, it really was. Yeah, yeah. it was just, I was, it was just amazing. Everybody just moved. Things just, just happened. You know, Ray, Ray Murphy was a phenomenal pilot. And he's looking. He's just like, okay, here we go, and let's just. Right. And, Everybody was together, and you've got that a military attitude. You know, we're just everybody was ready to go right in and, and get it done, and it was, it was an the incredible The other thing operation. I think is important to illustrate here, when at the Reno Air Race, there's a lot of people in the stands. A lot of those folks in the stands that came mm -hmm. down and supported it were also veterans, wow. people that were yeah. in the medical community, nurses, uh, a couple docs, and just civilians that were there just watching, as civilians now, just watching the air races who who reacted immediately and came down and helped out with the tragic yeah. accident. I think this goes to show that, and we, we would never hope that any kind of catastrophe like that would ever happen again, but it goes to show that just serving with a uniform on, it, you're not limited to that role, that even mm -hmm. outside of the military, you can put your, yourself into a position in which you're serving the community, and should something happen, then that natural training, that natural reaction, will allow you to contribute in, in saving lives, maybe the way that veterans have saved lives in places like combat before. Absolutely. 
Well, I want to thank you both for being a part of the show, Brett and Mike. Uh, it's fantastic that you both are, are and, and it's not just the two of you. There are many more out there, many more out there who are not on the set tonight who are a part of this Huey effort, mm -hmm. and we want to thank them as well as you both for every hour that you spend putting that, uh, that Huey up in the air and flying around our veterans or saving uh, lives in our community. Thank well, you like both. anything else, it's a real team effort, yeah, and that's, that's it. We're just thank drivers. Thank you for service, guys. You Appreciate it very thank much. You. No yeah. problem. We're now going to show you a video from Purple Heart Homes, a great nonprofit where veterans can get involved and volunteer in their community. As I look back now, I, I had the best of the best from right from the moment I was hurt on the battlefield to the moment I retired. And my community continued that. Um, and brought me home, they welcomed me. And that moment there really influenced the creation of Purple Heart Homes. Uh, the, the feelings that it gave me, the feelings that it gave the community, and the willingness of people to come out and give their time and uh, just because I was a soldier and because of what I had sacrificed. We knew that we could make it happen again. We just, we really want to see the veterans encouraged, lifted up, and to know that they can go out and they can be a part of their community in a great way. And that's the most gratifying, and I, and I really, I really try and look for that in, in all of our bids. Not just that their needs are met, but that they're able to have a, a change within them, that they have that confidence and still back in them. A simple ramp can have just as much impact as an entire house. That one little thing or, or a new bathroom could be a really huge impact on these older veterans' lives. And, and from day one, Dale and John have spoke from the heart and, and got their message and their vision out, you know. And they're my two heroes. They're two genuine American heroes to have served and fought for their country, been wounded, but to come home and start a project that helps other disabled veterans, I mean, you just can't say enough about them. That's, I mean, because what they have to offer comes right from here. Purple Art Homes doesn't just come in and remodel your home. Um, they, don't, they don't pick up the tools and, and, and the signs and leave when, you're, when they're done. Um, this is a, a family organization. As an organization, they are a lifeline. They are a hotline to the vets. They're a willing ear, they're a helping hand, they're there for you. We, we know that there's a lot of things that people think are wrong with America, but every day we get to see what's right with what we do. Welcome back to Veterans Voices. Tonight's show is Reboot 3, Veterans Volunteering in the Community. We are now joined by three local veterans from the organization, Vietnam Veterans of Diablo Valley. Welcome John, Jerry, and Bill. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. How are you guys doing this evening? Good, good. Good. Great. Mm -hmm. So tell us, somebody jump in and tell us a little bit about some of the projects that you, that you guys support here in our local community. Well, the Vietnam Vets, uh, was established primarily for camaraderie, networking, and community service. Um, recently, though probably the last 15 years, it's been community service uh, in serving veterans. Yeah. So. Now we had Team Rubicon and we had um, the Mission Continues on the show and they're national organizations. So Vietnam Vets of Diablo Valley is a more of a local organization. We wanted to feature uh, how some of our local organizations are creating these community service opportunities for veterans. So uh, Bill, you, you're involved in, in some community service here. Uh, the Speakers Bureau, for example. Tell us about the Speakers Bureau. Uh, myself and Mike Martin uh, co-direct the Speakers Bureau. We've spoken over 61,000 students since, well, 2002. We, we were speaking before that, but it was 2002 when we started 
you know, mm -hmm. keeping numbers on it. Wow. And the 61,000 is an accurate count. Okay. Mostly high schools. Okay. We've spoke at colleges. We speak at um, sometimes motivational speakers for Son Delta activities. What are you speaking about? Vietnam. Okay. And basically what we're covering is Mike at the beginning of the speech will cover statistics on Vietnam that most people don't realize. Excuse me, statistics like 25% of those that served in Vietnam were drafted. That means 75% volunteered military service. I see. Okay. And it's important for them to understand these things. This is a history lesson for them. It and is a history lesson and it's history classes in high school and college where we usually instruct. And from what I understand, you actually fly the Huey that we just talked about with Mike and Brent. I sometimes. do not fly. Uh, well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so, so Bill doesn't fly. <laughs> I don't fly. We know Bill doesn't fly. But we know that sometimes during the, um, during the speakers' bureaus, the, the helicopter is a part of this. We have um, brought the helicopter into yeah. several schools, and uh, the students are, they're, they're, they get the gift of seeing a piece of history coming in. Okay. And the helicopter is the workhorse of Vietnam, and it's an extreme large part of the history of Vietnam. So they get to hear it from you, actual veterans who have served in Vietnam, and they get to kind of see the effect from this Huey landing on their, on their baseball field or their football field. Absolutely. Yeah. And not only veterans from Vietnam, but we've had World War II, we've had Pearl Harbor survivors, Korean War. Wow. Um, uh, so veterans really, also. Really special and Jerry coordinated all the different uh, not only branches but eras on uh, yeah. there. So it's, and, and this is happening right here in our community right. and there's other things that are happening as well. Jerry you you do Operation Santa, you direct mm -hmm. Operation Santa Claus. Operation every Santa year. Claus is an effort to give back to those that are served, those that are serving and um, uh, make the holiday season a bit more pleasant for them and thanking them for their sacrifices. Santa Claus comes out, children get toys. Bill they, Green is our get, is Mr. Santa Claus. You just gave away a secret. You can't be oh, saying that now. <laughs> you just gave away. Yeah. I'm just one of the elves. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Great things happen. It, it's yeah. magical. It's if for some families it may be the only Christmas that they exactly. get to enjoy. Exactly. Um, when you're serving, uh, currently, uh, the only active uh, service people that we have here are Coast Guard, uh, um, Coast Guard men and women. And to live on an economy based on, say, a basic sergeant, a uh, three-striper, um, his, his, his annual salary amounts to only about $30,000. So can you imagine a family of husband, wife, and a couple of kids trying to exist on a Bay Area um, economy, mm -hmm. which is almost impossible. Many of them are surviving on food stamps. Right. So we try to make their holiday season a little more enjoying by providing them with right. Christmas gifts um, and other help. And so John, this, you're a part of this and you're, you're, you do a lot of community service that requires putting in several hours of your own time. Why do you do this? Why do you uh, find it important as a veteran to continue serving in your community? When you end up either retiring or uh, having spare time, it's important to uh, give back and get involved. And uh, to me, uh, having served, there's nothing more important than giving back to fellow veterans or uh, those who are still serving. Uh, we work closely with the uh, Blue Star Moms, and they have sons and daughters that are currently serving. And uh, it's uh, a very rewarding feeling. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, uh, you have that warm feeling inside. It's the paycheck uh, that uh, you've done something worthwhile that day. Uh, you've helped somebody, and uh, it's uh, extremely rewarding. Uh, something that all three of you have been involved in, and we actually got an email tonight from Earl Conklin, who is a part of the Vietnam veterans of Diablo Valley, and a Vietnam vet as well, and we failed to mention that all three of you are Vietnam veterans, Navy and Army, and uh, Earl mentions that he is a Vietnam veteran having served with the 1st Infantry Division in Lao Cai, 
I don't know. Okay. Like, hey? And he created a joint venture between an open water swim club uh, uh, and Vietnam veterans of Diablo Valley to teach veterans how to swim in the ocean and swim from Alcatraz Island to the beach in San Francisco. So he's talking about Take the Rock. Right. And uh, I've been crazy enough to be a part of that yep. uh, a couple of years ago, and many other yeah. veterans have as well, and non-veterans have participated in this annual event. Tell us about this, uh, Take the Rock. It's a swim challenge. It's to uh, allow a veteran to step up and uh, do something for themselves to, to really meet a challenge mm -hmm. of something they think they can't do. <laughs> Um, so, so they get to swim in the ocean uh, from Alcatraz to San Francisco, yeah. but, but someone has to organize this. Someone has to create an opportunity for them to train, and, and someone has to support the, uh, the, the, the costs that are involved, and, and uh, that's <coughs> Earl. Well, Earl is Earl. a part of your organization. Well, that's the Vietnam and Vets. Our that's board of directors, and all three of us are on the board, mm -hmm. and we support it financially, and like you said, uh, Earl, is the coordinator for the swim, and then we set up committee chairs for each part of it. And it's uh, extremely well organized and uh, functions extremely well. And we've had two swims so far, and we're looking forward to a third one. I've been to many of the um, welcome homes that we have of yes. the returning veterans of yes. the current conflicts. And I, I, I see you guys there in almost every one of them. Uh, Talk a little bit about what it means to be able to participate that in correlation to what it was like when you guys came home. I think for many of us, well, all of us that served in Vietnam, we never had the welcome home. Um, and I think for most of us that participate in the welcome home, we don't want to see veterans, people that are serving or have served, be treated like we were treated when we came home. Um, I really did not receive a welcome home until my first 4th of July parade in 1992 in Danville. And that was the first time I think people as in the community and people as a whole welcomed us back. And from then on, I think it, uh, it became important to me and other Vietnam veterans to be sure that never again will those that, are ser those that serve will ever be treated like we were treated. My experience was 1995 <laughs> in the same parade, mm -hmm. and the Vietnam vets distribute 10,000 American flags to the children that are along the parade route. And uh, we don't really march. We hand out flags to promote patriotism uh, in the community. Uh, and the, and the, another organization involved in that is the Diablo Valley Flag Brigade. That's correct. And uh, I got to go to the Welcome Home for Brent's son, Brent, who was up here yes. earlier. And the, I think the great thing about the Welcome Homes, I'm glad you brought that up, Kevin, is not only do we get to make them feel special and feel, make them feel a part of our community, but we actually get to stay connected to them. You know, when I went, up to the, when I went to the Welcome Home for Brent's son, I got to learn about what he did in the Marine Corps. And it was amazing how much the Marine Corps had changed since I had been in. And just staying connected to him meant that it, it, it was important to me that his, that his job in the Marine Corps was so specialized, that, his, that he took his duty uh, so seriously, and he had just got back from Afghanistan. So although he was in the Marine Corps and stationed at a, at a base several hundreds of miles away, we are still able to stay connected with what his role was in the military. I want to remind everyone that tonight's episode is titled Reboot 3, Veterans Serving in the Community. And we have Vietnam veterans of Diablo Valley. We have three Vietnam veterans on the stage tonight, uh, John, Jerry, and Bill. And I want to invite you to call in, write an email, or chat with us, ask any questions or comments. And you can find out from these gentlemen directly of why they spend several hours investing into their community and what they get from it. I, I want to mention that, you know, all of us have been involved in a lot of different things. One thing that really impressed me was we got involved in working with the Wheelchair Foundation and we volunteered at a lot of their events and we had the opportunity to go back to Vietnam in 2006 and 2012 and gave wheelchairs, distributed them uh, to orphanages and those that were disabled. And uh, it kind of closed the book for me uh, on something that was an extremely uh, moving trip. And uh, 
that's another local organization. We, we worked with them uh, volunteering, and that's how uh, our organization was able to take the local brand new wheelchairs over there. And so that, that was a special. What, what a fantastic event. opportunity, John. Yeah. I'm really glad you mentioned that because I think that a lot of, I think a lot of combat veterans stay connected to the place that they served. I think World War II veterans, for example, may stay connected. Korean War veterans, Vietnam veterans stay connected to where they served in combat. Iraq, Afghanistan, Desert Storm, and there's many other examples we're missing other eras. And so they're, they're, through organizations like yours, Vietnam Veterans of Diablo Valley, you've been able to stay connected to Vietnam, and you've been able to go back to Vietnam and serve that community as well as you've served this community since leaving the military. And one last thing I'd like to point out because we're just about out of time, is you guys have put together a tremendous resource center at the Danaville Veterans Memorial Building, is yes. that correct? That is correct. Where people can come and, and see the history. Local beautiful people can building. come and, and it's a beautiful building, it's been rebuilt, and you've put, a, put together a resource center that That's gives correct. a lot it's of this open information. to all veterans, not just local. Great. Right, there's yeah. a museum, a library, and a resource center, and uh, it, returning vets uh, can get up there, use a quiet space, computers, well, gentlemen, there's, there's unfortunately not enough time to talk about all the ways that you have served this community. I want to thank and Kevin uh, on behalf of yourself as well for your service and for the way you're serving our community. And thank you for being a part of the show tonight. We appreciate the thank opportunity. You. Thanks, for Thanks for having appreciate us. It. We now have something special, very special. Now, this is a little different for Veterans Voices. We're taking risk here. But combat veteran and comedian Katie Robinson will now be entertaining us with her live comedy routine followed by an interview. Katie served in two combat tours to Iraq and Afghanistan as the head aviation bat uh, battle captain, where she was responsible for all daily tactical operations within her unit. After four years of active duty service, Katie left the Army honorably in June of 2012. During her years in the service, Katie maintained her lighthearted humor often creating sketches to perform for her soldiers during training to ease the pain of these sometimes boring yet mandatory safety briefings. She was soon designating, designated the safety officer where she took upon herself the, to make a tedious safety briefing into its own individual comedic show. You probably can relate. Today, Captain Katie, as she's fondly referred to, embraces her storytelling style on stage mixed with retelling of her humorous life experiences and observations. Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to welcome Captain Katie to our Veterans Voices show. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. It's really, I'm really honored to be here. Um, you know, one of the questions that us veterans get asked all the time is, what'd you do, what was your job? And I actually was a chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear warfare officer. And so, you know, I figure the Army you know, knew that would be a great fit for me, seeing as that I majored in theater. <laughs> <laughs> you know, what I really think happened is, you know, somebody along the line was like, hey, you know what, we can send her to Iraq to look for those weapons of mass destruction. Maybe she can act like they're actually over there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they weren't, by the way. <laughs> I checked. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I was kind of an unconventional officer. Um, I used to, I guess, come up with parodies every once in a while, but really the whole thing started off because I really didn't know the actual lyrics to songs, and so I'd come up with my own little twist, and it all started when I was mopping the floors of the barracks with a fellow soldier. We're taking turns, and I'm watching her mop, and I just started going, I like the way you mop. See the water go drip, drip, drop. Slide in across the floor. Back it up right to the door. Yeah, I like the way you mop. Just flip it around and flop. Don't have to use a sponge. Just bend right down and lunge. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, that happened. And uh, <laughs> I ended up, after that, being designated the cadence caller. And as we all know as veterans, you know how tedious it is to sing cadences. So I'd come up with a new one every once in a while. Like, if I could only counter column, I wouldn't be so solemn, a half wit of a brain. I'd be up and I'd be cheery. Life just wouldn't be so dreary if we could all just march the same. <laughs> <laughs> or when I was in Afghanistan, I came up with, all the Taliban in Afghanistan, you better run, better run, I'll run my gun. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. <laughs> you know, one of the craziest times, though, was when a politician was visiting the bases and, you know, he heard through the grapevine that there was an officer who sang parodies. And isn't that fun? 
So uh, he comes up to me, he's like, this better be good. And I wanted to say, careful what you wish for. Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was listening to John Mayer that day, and I was feeling a little emotional, I guess. Because this is just what popped out of my mouth was, me and all my soldiers were all misunderstood. They say we stand for destruction and all the killing that we could. But you see, that's exactly what's going wrong with this country and those who lead it. Can't you see that we don't have the means to rise above and beat it? So we keep waiting, waiting, waiting on you to make the change. <laughs> there you go. Right there you, go. You, know, um, you know, I know that we have some uh, Gold Star families out there uh, who've lost loved ones. And if, you know, if you've ever been to a military funeral, you know about these guys called the Westboro Baptist Church. And last year, the founder of the Westboro Baptist Church, Fred Phelps, died. And we're coming up on the one year anniversary and you may not have known that he actually died on the International Day of Happiness. <laughs> and so uh, I came up with a little ditty about his life. <laughs> little ditty about the life of Fred Phelps. He hated all military and everyone they helped. Freddie went and found the Westboro Church where he protested funerals, phone soldiers on the search. Will I say, oh yeah, karma is strong. You're burning hell while we're laughing on. Oh yeah, they say that karma is strong. You evil man are where you belong. Burn on. <laughs> You know, I want to leave you guys on a more serious note. Uh, when we, us veterans come home from war, you know, we face a lot of challenges. And, you know, a couple of them are homelessness and depression leading to suicide. And, uh, you know, I've been on the brink of both myself. And, you know, one of the things that helps me out is, you know, comedy and music. And so I put those two together and I created a song. So hopefully you guys enjoy. And yes, I decided to possibly play this on the street for money. Got no work and got no pay. Bills been due since yesterday. And I know you'll tell me to go get a job. I was a captain in the army. Now I have PTSD and I bet you think I'm on drugs. I want you to know this is not how I want it to be But I want to know Would you sit down and talk to me Stop calling me a casualty Now I'll get serious Tried to die the other day Cause this pain won't go away And I bet You think I should be locked up Well, ain't this a crying shame? Vets come home and go insane. And I know that's what Fox News tells you. But I want to know, would you sit down and talk to me? Instead of believing what you've heard and seen on TV. What's happening to us is a tragedy. But I want to know, would you sit down and talk to me? Because I want you to know, there is nothing I'm prouder to be than a veteran who fought for you to be free. Next time, why don't you talk to me? Because I just don't know who I'm supposed to be. Job. Great thank job, you so much. Katie. Thank you so much. That was hilarious. It was real. <laughs> it was entertaining. It was beautiful. Good. And uh, thank you so much for sharing that. That was just, I'm so glad to be a part of this show tonight <laughs> and to uh, have a chance to watch you tell a little bit of jokes and sing some songs, parody or not. Um, fantastic. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Thank you so much.
So we know that you served in Afghanistan, and we know you were a captain, and I, mm -hmm. I don't know what you said in terms of your MOS, nuclear, biological, chemical, a radiological specialist. Um, yeah. But uh, tell us a little bit more about your decision to join the Army and, and how you found yourself in Afghanistan. And, uh, and when, 2010, you were there? Yeah, and I was in Iraq in, I in 2009. Oh, in Iraq. Okay, yeah. yeah, tell us a little bit about your decision to join the military. Uh, well, I mean, I'm from Syracuse, New York, and a lot of my family's from New York itself. And so when 9-11 happened, I think, you know, that really impacted me. And, you know, my family just was very lucky that day that they they all, my uncle who lived or who worked right next to the building, he was not feeling well that morning, so he was an hour late to work. And so oh, he was on wow. his way um, when the towers were hit. Oh, wow. And he actually, his commute was to walk under, you know, the tunnels of the towers and stuff. And so he luckily was not there. And yeah. my cousins... You know, it was the same type of thing. They just didn't want to go to work that morning because so they as siblings fought and so didn't show up. So thank God because their building was destroyed. Yeah. So um, anyway, so that I just felt like, you know, it hit home. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It really did hit mm -hmm. home. And I just yeah. wanted to do something for my country. And I kept hearing all these horror stories that were happening to soldiers over there, you know, being mistreated as well. Mm -hmm. And I thought, you know, what's the best way that I you know, help these soldiers out. What's the biggest impact I can make? Well, it was to be an officer, because I thought at least I'd have a little bit of a voice. Mm -hmm. and so I wanted to join and make a difference and bring as many soldiers as I could home, every single one that I could. And I'm really happy to say that all of my soldiers while I was in Iraq and Afghanistan, they did come home. Wow, yeah, but, something uh, to be proud of. Yeah, but you know, I, I did lose a lot of friends that were in mm -hmm. different units as well, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Well, we're glad that you came home, and I think Thank it's you. fantastic to hear about what drew you into service in the military. <laughs> and of course, you served four years honorably. Thank, Thank you. you. And, uh, and you've been driven into continuing community service through your comedy, but through also real efforts to yes. support nonprofit organizations. And you have a very particular interest. <laughs> and, and share that with us a little bit, please. Uh, well, right now, um, I'm with uh, Veterans in Film and Television. It's a nonprofit that helps out. Uh, veterans in the community that are trying to get into the film industry and you know through whether you're an actor or producer or director and we all kind of come together and it all started with basically a Facebook group pretty much of you know getting together and um, it's turned into you know this really great community of veterans coming together and the, you know a lot of big actors and big names and stuff that a lot of people forget are actual veterans you know are part of our community so it's really wonderful and you know, I love, I love volunteering really at anything. Anybody tells me that there's a great project coming up, because that's where I usually find it out through the Veterans Film and Television. I come up with, I found out through an organization called Operation IV, which is trying to, it's a nonprofit trying to prevent the two, 22 suicides a day. You were telling me about that earlier, yeah. yeah. I don't mean to stop you, yeah. but we have an email here from Nicholas in Orlando, uh, Nicholas Orlando, excuse me, from Pittsburgh, California here. As an Iraq War veteran, what can we learn from Vietnam veterans on helping the community and helping recent Iraq War veterans transition back into the community? It, you know, I think this question probably could have come up when we had the Vietnam veterans on the stage. But Katie, why don't you tell us, uh, as an Iraq War veteran, uh, what have you learned from helping the community and helping other veterans? Uh, which you mentioned the veterans of film and television. What have you learned from these experiences? What I've really learned is that, you know, you actually feel good, that you have a purpose. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the main thing that a lot of veterans are missing when they come mm -hmm. home. I know that's, I can speak for myself absolutely and for a lot of my friends as well as you had a purpose over there. Mm -hmm. You knew what you were doing, you right. had a job. Right. And when you're at war, especially, your job is extremely important. And so when you come home, you feel lost. Yeah. And you don't really know, have a sense of self anymore. Yeah. And you know, I think that's what's really important is when you go and volunteer, you have a sense of purpose again because right. you see firsthand that difference you're making, whether you're building a shed you know, for, you know, or just digging out ditches or taking right. trees off of homes. You're making a right. difference in these people's lives, and that makes you feel good and make you feel a part of your sense of community again. Very well said, Katie, and I'm glad that that was the last thing that was said on the stage because you said it perfectly. That's what tonight's show is about. Thank you for being here. Thank you Thank for you. your service. Thank you for all the work that you do. Thank you so Thank much. You. On our website, you will find a list of helpful veterans resources that were discussed in tonight's show. If you don't have access to the internet, call the Contra Costa County Veterans Service Office and the number listed on, on the last screen. Tonight, joining us, we had Angela Anderson on the show from Team Rubicon. For more information on this organization or to get involved, visit teamrubiconusa.org. 
The mission continues, empowers veterans to serve their community in new ways. For more, inf more information on them, go to missioncontinues.org or call the number on your screen. We were fortunate enough to have Mike and Brent from the Vietnam Helicopter Museum with us today. They have a great website with lots of historical information and videos. That's at vietnamhelicopters.org. And also John, Jerry, and Bill from uh, our local Vietnam veterans of Diablo Valley. They can be found at vnvdv.com. Lastly, we would like, well, of course, we'd also like to thank Katie for being here tonight. So, and, and then we would like to direct you to the Contra Costa Veterans Service Office, which has a wealth of resources for you. Go to their site or call 925-313-1481. There are some great events coming up in this area. On Tuesday, February 24th, the Marines Memorial Club will be hosting the 70th anniversary of the Battle for Iwo Jima Commemoration Luncheon. There will be a special screening of the film, The Forgotten Flag Razors. This event is free for Iwo Jima veterans and their guests. On Wednesday, February 25th, the Contra Costa County Workforce Investment Board and the California Employment Development Department are hosting the Central Contra Costa County Career Fair. On Saturday, March 14th, there is a Veterans Service Organization Corned Beef and Cabbage Fundraiser Dinner supporting the Danville Veterans Memorial Building Operating Committee. There will be live entertainment, a silent auction, a raffle, and much more. Contact Lee Halverson for tickets to this great event. On Saturday, March 28th, Team Red, White, and Blue, Team Rubicon, and the mission continues, will, con will join forces and run as one for a 5K or longer in over 100 United States locations to celebrate collaboration, community, and camaraderie. Again, they are on our show tonight, so be sure to be involved with their efforts. We'd like to remind you that on September 11th, the Delta Veterans Group will be sponsoring Stand Down on the Delta at the Contra Costa County Fairgrounds. This is a really important event for homeless veterans. Our next Veterans Voices will be on March 16th, so tune in on Contra Costa TV or watch the live stream on our website. We want to remind you that this episode will be rebroadcast on CCTV Monday nights at 7 p.m., Wednesdays at 11, and Saturdays at 9 a.m. Of course, you can watch all past episodes anytime on our website, ContraCostaTV.org forward slash Veterans Voices. I want to thank all of our guests and our viewers. This is Veterans Voices of Contra Costa wishing you all a good evening. Thank you for serving. Mm -hmm.